Welcome to this week's episode of the Baseball Together Podcast, Baseball Family. This week we have an unofficial no-hitter, Fernando Tatis Jr. versus the LA Dodgers and the Braves Mount Rushmore right now. Nine Plus Us presents the Baseball Together Podcast with your hosts, Blackjack Brad and Kansas City Little Big Briggy Blue Eyes. And now, Baseball Together. Welcome to this week's episode of the Baseball Together Podcast, Baseball Family. I am Brad, and as per usual, I am joined to my right by our guy Brig. Hey, Baseball Family, what's shaking? What's shaking? All right. All right, we've got a whole (laughs) lot, a whole lot of big stuff to get into this week. Lots of news. Uh, And then, we're like I said, we're going to get into our Atlanta Braves, Milwaukee Braves, Boston Braves, whatever, however you want to call them. We're just calling the Braves Mount Rushmore. Uh, to finish things up today. But let's start with this. First, we had Madison Bumgarner no-hit the Braves, but yeah. it's an unofficial no-hitter because it was on this is the second game of a doubleheader, and as we know, MLB has adapted the seven-inning doubleheader this year. Okay, now, right. Brig, uh, I got a question for you about this. Okay. Should it, should it count as an official no-hitter? Your thoughts, yep. sir. Next question. It, yeah, it should. I I am absolutely with you, one hundred percent. Hold on. Now I, I have a follow up question. Okay. Why is this a question? Because apparently it is. I don't know. I don't know why <laughs> it's a question. It I don't be. understand. Because here's the thing, Brick. Here's the thing I have for you. Ready? Yeah. There are three. I guess a uh, a trifecta of questions that we should ask to qualify to qualify this. Okay. Sure. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready, and I know well, what you're going to say. Was Go it ahead. an was it an official game? First off, yep, an official game. Okay, was he awarded a complete game yep. for pitching all seven innings? Okay, and did the Braves record a hit? Nope. Okay, there we go. That's a no-hitter. That's an official no-hitter, folks. That's uh, congratulations, pretty Madison Bumgarner. He finally got it. He got over the hump, and he got himself a no-hitter. There we go. And, yeah, and Major League Baseball, suffering. there you have it. Not just struggling, but suffering. I mean, it's been not great. Yes. Yeah, but I, can't. I mean, there were times when he was in San Francisco where he got close, but he couldn't get over the hump. That's and right. I, that's what I'm saying is he's finally able to do it. Because yeah. regardless of it's seven or nine innings, you get to the sixth or seventh inning of a shortened game, teams are going to be a little more motivated to get hits just like they are in the eighth or ninth inning. Like, okay, we need base runners. Just get on base, right? Well, but they, even they in didn't. a regular game, even in even in nine yeah. innings, you get to six, the the other team starts getting yeah. itchy bad. Yeah, and and you've seen you've seen some live pitching for the day, you know, besides just batting practice, you've seen in game pitching, which I feel like makes a big difference. I think that's why you part of the reason you see guys start to get hits later in the game is you you get up there twice, you're like, okay, third time, I'm ready. You're not going to get me this time. Totally. And that's when the hits start to pile up, right? Exactly. That's exactly how. And you get to the sixth, seventh inning, even in a game like that, like it's an accomplishment. It is. How often do we see no hitters get broken up at the fifth, sixth inning? All every time. I mean, there's got to be at least four or five a week. Every, I mean, every single time. Seventh, seventh inning is where it goes down a lot. And this, this is my take on the on the matter is that. If like just like you said, if we're gonna call it a game, if it's an officially recorded game, which mm-hmm. we all know, five and a half innings, official game, right? Five innings mm-hmm. is yeah. the cutoff. You get to five and a half, you're for sure have a comp- have a game. Goes on the books, yeah. right? Yep. So, <laughs> like, why why is this a question? I don't understand. Yeah, if I, they're going yeah, to change know. the rules to make the game. Only last seven innings for the doubleheader, which I think we agree is a great idea. Everybody likes it. Well, the, I'm feeling like it's less less than great. It's it's fine. Is is kind of where it's I've gotten acceptable. To be with it. it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's I acceptable that, given the circumstances is where I'm at right now. What's that? I, it's acceptable given the circumstances is where I'm at with it right now. Sure, sure, sure. So what? Wait a minute. Hold on. You're saying that if you're going to have a doubleheader, you want to see nine and nine innings yeah if they're not going to give guys the credit that's due right right but we didn't know that until this week so tell me exactly and that's why i'm upset with it it's like well okay exactly what's going to happen then have them play nine that's exactly what i was going to do i was leading up to that (laughs) 
<laughs> okay. We're on oh. the same page. <laughs> we are absolutely on the same page. Forget and you this know what? I'll, decision. I'll, I'll I'll finish this I'll finish this whole segment with this. So I was listening to Dan Patrick last week, and one of the things they were talking about was the seven inning double headers. And uh, one of the guys, I think it was Seton, Seton O'Connor, said, uh, "He's like, you've got a problem with your game, or the le- or your leadership, if you're trying to get it over faster." <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, yeah, that's a great point. And that's. I kind of I agree with him that if if you're like uh, let's get this thing over, like why? You should want people to want to watch your product longer. Yeah, you shouldn't be encouraging a short attention span. You know, so my dad, my dad says very often, "I'll give you five reasons it won't work," but that's ridiculous because <laughs> if you get one reason it won't work it that's good enough right <laughs> like yeah it's the same kind of logic it's like why why are we talking about this <laughs> yeah yeah all right let's move on we've we've agreed on the seven inning double yeah, hitters not have. a good idea anymore now that we've seen this give mad bum the official no hitter yeah all right we had fernando tatis take on not just trevor bauer but <laughs> Pretty much the entire L.A. Dodgers pitching staff this weekend. Mm. He hit two home runs Friday, two home runs Saturday, and one on Sunday. That is, count them, five home runs in three days. Mm. Uh, that's outstanding, first off. Uh, but so this was, this was like the most amazing thing. Okay, so Trevor Bauer is well <laughs> known for being a troll, especially this <laughs> last spring training. He took his troll to like the next level, right? And we love him where for he it. Was, Let's be honest. We do, we do, because it's fun. We need to see more of it. You know, there's one where he was like closed one eye while he's pitching, and he's he's been doing the Conor McGregor strut off the mound for a little while. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Tatis hits a home run off of him to lead off the game on yeah. Saturday, and as he's rounding first, he turns around and looks back at the Padres dugout and covers one eye. Okay, that's awesome. It's awesome. Bauer says he did. Bauer says he didn't see it because he's like, I have my own thing I do when I give up home runs, so I didn't see it. But he's like, that's fine. Uh, and then, and then, uh, Tatis hit another home run off of him. I believe it was in the seventh inning and came around. And as he touched home plate, he did the Conor McGregor strut. <laughs> and outstanding as well, by the way. I'd actually like to see more guys do that. It's the best. It's so, funny. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> so... But this is the best part of all of it, is that Trevor Bauer says he's cool with it. He's fine with it because basically what it came down to is I don't want guys to get upset if I'm doing that to them, so I'm not going to get upset if they do it back to me. Like right. He's a guy who, who can dish it and take it, yep. right? Yep. That's a- and this was, this was the gem of it all. I'm sorry, Brig, I'll let you talk in just a second as I do my best Kanye impression. (laughs) (laughs) He said, throwing a batters for that is soft. (laughs) Shots fired. Yes, it is. I've been saying this for years. It is soft for you to get upset about somebody else having success against you in sports because that's how the game works. Hmm. Yep, yep. So let that sink in. What do you think, Brick? Well, I think, I think it's worth letting that sink in. But I also, <laughs> I, I think. Okay, let me play devil's advocate. This flies in the face of all of the unspoken rules, the unwritten rules, the unattributed uh-huh. rules, whatever un precursor the un, the you want. Rules you want to throw on the front of that. <laughs> Seriously, though, there's there there are layers on these rules. And they're all etiquette based mm-hmm. and they're all ridiculous, but they've all been held to for a really long time. And we over the last couple of years have talked repeatedly about how these unwritten rules and these these unspoken etiquette like items are now being challenged and we baseball will never be the same. It will never be the same. It will never go back to the way it was when Nolan Ryan was throwing heat. It just won't. And do, now do <laughs> here we go everybody cool out S- trigger warning <laughs> okay this is your trigger <laughs> warning because i'm the traditionalist and i think that if a pitcher wants to throw a little chin music and freak out 
Tatis Jr., do it. I, I have no problem with that. But be absolutely in control. If that thing goes wild, you're going to get hemmed up. You just are. There's no getting around it, right? So if you better be surgically accurate if you're going to throw at somebody, intentionally miss mm-hmm. for a little chin music or, or whatever. This throwing behind them thing, you know, it, it's, I don't know. I think it's gimmicky. I think it's an attempt at what is this lost art of, of chin music and, and you know, somebody crowds the plate against Nolan Ryan or e- even as late as Roger Clemens, they're going to get pushed back, right? That's how it went. And and I always thought it was so stupid. There's no reason for it. See, but I have no problem no with it. For it. I got no problem with it at all. If the pitcher wants to give up a ball in the count – to send a message to the guy at the plate, that's fine. That's his discretion. He's got he's got he's well within his rights to do that. And that's the game inside the game. And I dig that. I dig that psychological game that that me versus you were the only two here. It's my favorite part of the baseball. It's my favorite part. So, and I don't think that's any surprise to anybody who's been listening to us for a while. Not only am I that's a traditionalist, yeah. but that's that that game inside the game, the the mental game, the psychological stuff, is is one of my favorite parts. So I don't think it's petty. I don't think it's soft. I don't think it's cheap. I think that it has to be done right, though. And see, that's the thing is, I feel like if you're throwing at somebody, like I get brushing them back because you you're trying to own the play, yeah. right? It's just like because. Because, you know, as you're sitting there talking, I'm like, you know what? You've got something to that, you know, brushing somebody back. It's just like in the like the 80s and 90s with with the NBA. You didn't let a guard get to the hoop. Never. Right? No, 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 never. You foul, foul him hard, yeah. foul him hard, and let him know that that's what's going to happen if you come you to the hoop. You can't it's come gonna on get the paint, It's going to hurt. Bro. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But this is the thing, too, though, is I feel like hitting somebody, like, yeah, you're putting them on base. That goes against you. But hitting somebody is the equivalent, in my opinion, to putting your your foot under theirs on a jump shot. Hmm. Right? Because they're going to come down and roll an ankle. Yeah. Like, you're intentionally trying to hurt somebody by throwing a baseball at them. Like, brush them back. That's sure. fine. Like, okay, I, yeah, I, I still own the plate. I'm still going to come inside on you because that's where I'm going to saw off your bat yeah. and you're not going to get another home right. run. You're going to have to do better to get a home run because I'm not going to leave it over the plate. Like, that's fine, but don't throw at them. Guys have gone beyond the brushing back and just flat out, like, thrown at guys. And it, yeah. Right? And that's that's what I think is soft. It's like the whole, well, you had success against me. Try to have success now. I'm going to hit you. Yeah. That's the issue that I no, have. And, and, that I, and, that's what, and that's where I agree with Bauer. That, that is soft. That is unsportsmanlike. That is soft. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Do I, do I okay. accept it for what it is and has been in the past? Absolutely. I still accept it as a part of the game. I hope nobody gets hurt, right? But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna side on this on this uh, again the traditional side where it's like you know if a, if a pitcher decides he's gonna throw at a batter, I don't agree with it. Mm-hmm. But I get the precedent has been set for a long time. Is it a little bit soft? I don't know yeah. that I don't know. Soft is the word I would choose. Immature, maybe. Are we talking semantics, splitting hairs here? Absolutely. But <laughs> but brushing back, like if we get away from intentionally plunking somebody, brushing back is is the answer. That's the answer. Well, and you, you know what though? The I saw a trend this weekend actually. I was I was kind of watching this once I noticed it watching for it that you don't have to brush a back guy brush a like intentionally brush a guy back to get him back off the plate. All you have to do is throw something about a hundred miles an hour high over the yeah. plate. And guys will guys will fall They'll down. Freak on the, out. On their own. Yeah. 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 Just put it yeah. in a couple like, inches. I saw it probably yeah. four or five times this weekend. They were ball, the ball was square down the middle of the plate and guys were ducking out of the way of a hundred mile an hour fastball. Yeah. It's like right. You don't have to you don't have to brush them back anymore. Guys are too scared to get hit in the face. Right. Well, and here's the difference. Back then, back when we're talking about Nolan Ryan, whatever, nobody knew they were hundred mile an hour mm-hmm. pitches. They were in some cases, yeah. but nobody knew that because the technology wasn't mm-hmm. good enough. 
So they had this false sense of security yeah. standing in the box, and they didn't understand what was yeah. happening. That they could literally die yeah. if they got hit by this chin music. <laughs> But yeah. now we have better understanding, we have better technology, we have better information, and that's why. That's why. You know, a guy throws. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you another thing. More people are throwing 97, 98, 99, and even breaking into the mm -hmm. 100s, the triple digits, more now than I think ever before. So that's why it's okay to throw center line and all the way right down the pipe, just up at the eye level, and those guys are getting brushed back. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I think is happening. Yeah. Anyway, yep. we talked about this a lot. All right, <laughs> let's let us continue on. We could talk for hours. Yeah, about this. we could. But uh, so you added this onto our lineup here. We have Kent Emmanuel tosses a gem in his debut for the Houston That's Astros. Right. So he came in after Jake Odorizzi threw just five pitches. He left the game with forearm That's tightness. Right. Can we say headed for Tommy John surgery? Most Ooh, likely. Oh, buddy, but I'm gonna tell you what. Yeah, we're just gonna say it. Yep. Because that is the first thing you see. That's what they call it. With Tommy John these That's days. what they call it every time. Every single every time, time it's, it's forearm, forearm tightness. tightness. Yes. It's it's like mm -hmm. it's yeah. it's like the crystal ball. If you see, if you hear forearm <laughs> tightness, you know Tommy John's being discussed. Doesn't mean it's gonna happen. It's definitely yeah. in the conversation. Well and you know, and the thing is, is that he's probably gonna wait six to eight weeks for it to sure. get better and they're going to reevaluate and be like oh it's not any better you need tommy john well i'll go get a second opinion two three weeks later okay i'm going to get tommy john so he's going to put it off and then he's going to obviously lose this whole year and luckily he's probably far enough uh early, early enough yeah. into this season that he might be able to come back next year maybe no i mean there's I a pretty know, good chance at this point i mean we're we're still it's about a, it's about a year recovery though it's about a year recovery. yeah yeah but it's only april it's only April. We have time yeah. for sure. Even if he stays on the roster and has to maybe even fight his way back onto the 40 man, we're, we have time. It's okay. He's, he, he'll be all right. What's not, what, but we'll what's see. interesting is this kid comes in in his debut, Kent Emanuel, and in relief, he tosses eight and two thirds innings, five hits, two runs. In the sixteen and two route over the Angels, I mean that's ugly. That's ugly. Well, and I think the fact that he had so much run support made it a little bit easier for Dusty Baker to keep him in totally. there. You, you know? can't deny that. And also, also no pressure. By the yeah. way, um, <laughs> not a care in the yeah. world <laughs> with that much run support. Yeah. So, well, but the, but even couldn't have asked for a better situation to make his debut. Even though, but, but despite that, early early in the game, he said, "I'm ready." He said, "I felt ready. I felt prepared." Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think he walked onto the mound. He took the hill, very very calm, which I think is remarkable for a guy in his debut. I don't think anybody, or let me recount, few people recant. Excuse me. Few people say I felt super ready. <laughs> in their debut and i think that's the remarkable part of the story yeah and then he delivered and that's i think yeah congratulations to him also he wears number zero which is starting to become more and more popular more and more common and i really like seeing that mm -hmm. i don't know why maybe it's the anomaly i dig but i dig it <laughs> yeah it, you know i i talk a lot about numbers like i always kind of joke about the guys who wear like numbers in the 70s and the 80s in baseball because that's not a baseball number that's a football yeah. number you know that's that's reserved for the receivers and what the offensive line something or defensive line yeah. something like that like those are it's not a baseball number even the 60s is getting more common you see, and you saw 50s and 40s sure. and stuff like that but like and Aaron Judge is wearing 99 you see a few more guys wearing 99 but uh the number 0 is a basketball number yeah. to me uh and so seeing it on a baseball field is strange and and we're seeing it more and more often it's really interesting to see well, it kind of started with Adam so, Ottavino in my, in my awareness, at least, with the Yankees when he came in. He wore a number zero in Colorado, and then he moved to New York, and he insisted on number zero. And mm -hmm. it's, I think, set some sort of trend or precedent where it's now okay to wear number zero. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But that's for me, that's where it all got started. I don't know. I mean... I mean, I've, I've noticed this year, Sam Haggerty for the Mariners is wearing number zero yeah. as well. 
and I don't know if it's like a whole if if it's like a like a Gilbert Arenas going back to the NBA real quick. Gilbert Arenas wore number zero. They called him Agent yeah. Zero um, because he said that he was told he was a zero. He didn't have enough talent to get there. And by the time he did, he's like, "Yeah, I am a zero. I'll show you." Number zero in the NBA, you know. And I wonder mm-hmm. if that's part of what these guys are doing with the number zero. If it's like I was told I wasn't good enough, but here I am. Yeah, I'll be a zero. I'll be a zero. Number zero in, in the big mm. leagues. That's pretty cool. I I, I so, don't know. I don't know. See, for me, I would, and this is pure speculation, but I would wonder if Adam Ottavino said, "I want a low number that's you know I can kind of carve out for myself." Nobody's ever worn it. Mm-hmm. It's not heralded in any way, and I'm going to wear number zero. Then you get. And it's not retired. Right, in New York. exactly. And he gets to New York <laughs> and he gets to choose that. It's perfect. It's yeah. anyway, it's the single digit yeah. number that's not that's available cool. in New York right now. <laughs> or as far as retired numbers, you know, it's the only one. So Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. All right, let's go on to Ryan yeah. Tapera. Ryan Tapera for the for the Cubs. So this is I thought this is interesting. His Suspension. We talked about his suspension last week. He was initially suspended three games for inciting a bench clearing right. brawl against the Brewers. Um, that was reduced to two games, um, which is what Nick Castellanos was suspended with the Reds. Um, now, they've kind of set a precedent here now. The guy who incites the brawl is the one who gets two games. However, Adam Eaton this weekend only got one game. Um, for inciting a brawl. And his was not anything that happened at the plate. His was actually a play at second base, and he got in. I didn't see who it was, but he got in somebody's face, and then bench is cleared, and then Eaton got one game. Now, I don't feel like, Brig, that you can sus- necessarily suspend the guy who caused the brawl because there's always something else that happens. It's like I said, this it's getting, it, it's getting mad at the kid who hit back. Yes, it, there's an inciting incident. <laughs> there's always yeah. There's always something that comes first. That lays the groundwork for what the, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, it's my thing is that benches, benches don't just no, clear, no. okay? There is stuff leading up to it. There's stuff leading up to a specific event. And Major League Baseball needs to take a little bit more time to evaluate, like, okay, this is what's the situation? What started this whole thing? What happened when there's that play at second base with Adam Eaton? Why was Tapera throwing behind, uh, throwing behind Brewers players? Like, what led to this? You know, maybe do a little bit more investigating rather than just throwing out these inspe- suspensions to these guys who have just had enough of whatever is going on. Okay, Brad, my question to you is, yeah. Are benches, are bench clearing brawls good or bad for baseball? That's complicated. <laughs> I feel like because it, it really is. It's it's entertaining. Every everybody, so like you get to be like twelve, thirteen years old, and you like to see yeah. it, right? Like, and and from then on, it, it's inter- it's an entertaining aspect of baseball, kind of like in hockey, the fight in hockey, well, right? Like you, it changes up the game, and 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 fights in hockey happen not just not necessarily because two guys are upset at each other, but they'll happen sometimes because the crowd is quiet. Yep. You know, and that's not that's why not why bench is clear in baseball, but it has the right. same effect. It'll get the crowd back in the game if it's right. sluggish. But on the other hand, I have a six year old who loves baseball, and. uh he saw a highlight where bench is cleared. He goes, dad, what happened? I was like, you know what? I don't know. Honestly, it looks like somebody got mad at somebody else and they started fighting. And then six year old who I'm trying to teach not to hit and not to fight. Like, that's hard. Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> Seeing a bunch of grown men, a bunch of baseball players who he's kind of wanting to look up to seeing them out there fighting. It's like, well, there was some progress that we've lost then, <laughs> but that that's the that's the issue yeah. I have with it is that if you want to have a family game you got to do something about that. But is it good for baseball? And that's I'm not asking if it's good for your kid because I have the same problem. Right. I'm asking if it's good for the brand. Yeah. Is it good for the game? Because you're right, the NHL has built their brand in part around gloves off, hands thrown. 
I mean, mm-hmm. everybody knows that's what happens. When you say we're taking the gloves off, well, there's that's the- what the entire – there's this whole cultural thing about taking the gloves off. And we all uh-huh. know it's because of hockey. When you're going to you're going to a fight and the hockey game is going to break That's what out. we know. That's what that means. That's what I'm saying. When you say benches mm-hmm. clearing, yeah. everybody knows what that means. There's no mistake in it. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Is it good for the game? Because look, look, it's not cricket. Okay, in cricket, right. in cricket, yeah. the guy who's getting ready to come up to bat is in the clubhouse. He's probably drinking or what I'm I'm embellishing. I have no idea. But you know what I mean? He walks down the I don't think you're probably, wrong, honestly. He walks down the steps onto the pitch. He's very excited. It's there's a crowd. He waves his little hat. Kind of like Jimmy Dugan, right? Wave a little hat. Everybody's excited. He gets to, <laughs> gets in front of the wickets and he's he's got his little flat bat and everything's very cool. And I'm not disparaging cricket at all. I think cricket's a really interesting game. It's very dynamic. And it's totally different from baseball, but it's it's that gentlemanly, you know, sort of like I don't, I, you know, like gentry appeal. There is a lot of gentlemanly aspects. There to are, cricket. Yes, there are, correct. and there's this etiquette that surrounds the play and the people on the field, the defenders. They could wait a very long time for this hot shot to come out of the clubhouse, down the steps, onto the pitch, in front of the wickets, set and ready to go before he will take a swing at the first ball, right? Like, that's how this goes in cricket. So I wonder, (laughs) it just makes me wonder if there's a raw dog appeal to baseball when the bench is clear. And if that, even though it seems, I mean, some people call it barbaric, some people call it immature, there's there's this spectrum of uh, attributions that people give it. But ultimately, what I'm asking is, is it or is it not good for baseball? Do fans like it or do they not? Will they show up to support it? I think fans do like it, right. honestly. And you know what, Brig? I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I, I get it. I get the benches clearing because I've been in totally. a bench clearing brawl before. Yeah. When I was 16, our bench is cleared in a tournament, and it was a ton of fun. Like, I didn't throw a punch or anything. I was, like, in the middle of it trying to hold guys back, but only kind of because I knew they were <laughs> going to fight somebody. But, like, like it, and it's fun. It's exciting. You're, like, in the moment, like, yeah. And then you get back to the dugout, like, yeah, let's go beat them. And then you do, you know. So it's, like, this whole big thing, and it's a ton of fun. But at the same time, as a dad, I'm, like, I do like seeing it. It's fun, and it probably is good for the game. I think you're right because it adds a, a new level of like, and I'm not even gonna say immaturity, uh, but I think rawness. I think is I think yeah. you touched on that, and that, I think that's the, the perfect description for it. That you're seeing, you are seeing the raw emotion in a game that is trying to take, or at least historically has tried to take so much yeah. of it out of it. Yeah, I agree. Right, so. That might be the aspect of it that's really good is that you're seeing those emotions flare, and that might have been why it even started because they're all trying so hard to keep their emotions check in check, and then something happens, and just the lid pops off, and everybody loses their minds. I don't know. Yeah, that well, might be it. I, but again, I don't think it say? matters. I I think that the excitement, the, the 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 dynamic that it adds to the game. I think I mm-hmm. think the law of unintended consequences here is at play, and we get people more engaged. And it's ridiculous that fighting yeah. and it's it's like Schadenfreude, right? It's like it's we want to watch the the our heroes yeah. fall. We want to watch the great people come down to our level, and that's psychology, man. That's that's mm-hmm. human nature. That's exactly what it is. So we end up excited and excitable about the prospect of of these fights and I don't think that's wrong and I don't think it's wrong for baseball. And I hate to say that because it is not what we want to teach our children, but it is good for baseball. So it's catch 22. I don't know how to feel the end. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, I like seeing it when it's just me sitting watching the game. Right. Like when it happens, I'm here like, yeah, go. here we go. Yeah. But then if my son sits there, I'm like, let's maybe change the channel because <laughs> this is not what I want to encourage with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's hard. It's hard. So yeah. baseball family, we're with you. 
we feel exactly the same way. And I don't know. If you're feeling the same way, let us know. Jump in the mailbag at baseballtogether.com <laughs> and tell us how do you feel about base uh, benches clearing brawls and baseball fights and base base that's, brawling. That, well, that's I like what I was going to gonna say, brawling. but yeah, base brawling, throwing at batters and and you know Bryce Harper's hat or uh, helmet going the wrong way and all that stuff. Like we want to know how do you feel. <laughs> if you didn't get that reference, let let us know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll shoot you the link. <laughs> <laughs> but before we go, Brad, I want to I want to talk about one more right. thing before we go. We've got to talk okay. about the All Star Game logo, which has been revealed now that they've moved to Colorado. They're going to go play in Denver, and um, the mm-hmm. the new All Star Game logo has been revealed. In it, I, I want to know how you feel about the the visuals, at least the visuals. Um. The visual, I think, I don't know, I think it looks pretty cool. Um, I I like the mountain version of the Rockies logo. Like, I like yeah. the way they incorporate that. Um, honestly, purple is not okay. my color. I've never liked that aspect of the Rockies. Um, but I kind of I kind of get it, having lived in the Rockies, not in Colorado. Um, but the way that they incorporate it with the silver... And the gray and the mountains on the bottom. I think it looks sharp. I think it's nice and clean. Um, pretty much what they did is they took the regular All Star logo from Atlanta, uh, took away the stadium aspects of that logo, and then threw mountains on it. Yeah, at the bottom, the bottom, and changed two the color points of the star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that's that's what they did with it. Was that they just were like, uh, in a pinch, take it. Uh, replace mountains. Okay, there we well, go. Well, what got they it did was they went with the simplest solution, right? They went with the 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 easy answer, yeah. and I think they absolutely nailed it. I mean, I I looked at that and I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. that tells the whole story. If you can take an icon logo like that, if uh-huh. you can take the one color or two colors, and if you can use strategically cut out lines and things like that and tell the entire story, that's all it takes. Man, all they did was do purple with a star, and then they put some jagged Rocky Mountain looking logos on the bottom, like the Colorado Rockies do with their alternate logo. Bada bing, you get the entire story. I was really excited about it. I think it looks terrific. I think they nailed it. Every year, they should think yeah. that little mm-hmm. about it. That's what I was going to say that this should be the <laughs> template. Not necessarily like no, cut and paste, you know, whatever, but like th- don't put any more effort exactly. into it than this, right? It doesn't need to be more it, complicated. And complicated than this. is the problem. So, when they went when they went I to Cleveland, uh, they did the the guitar like the Strat sort of outline, whatever, or Fender or whatever it was, and it, uh-huh. it, it looked great. It looked great, but it was it was one step too complicated. My personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that Major League Baseball does a lot with logos. Like uh like extracurricular logos. They they tend to take it a little too far. And uh they because the Atlanta one was, was kind of busy. busy. Right? It had the star and then it had like the like there's like a bridge thing for like the top of the stadium, stuff like that. It looked like kind of like stadium features that they included into it because obviously the sure. new stadium they want to highlight. But uh, but there was there was a lot going on there, and then this was yeah. just much more simple, and I, I like it I like it a lot better. And I got to be honest, purple. I know you you got your own opinion on it, and I'm not going to disparage that. But for <laughs> me, it's different, and I love different. That's why I like the Sedona red and the turquoise yeah. in Arizona. That's why I love the purple uh-huh. in Colorado. Yeah. That's why I love orange in a couple of places. It shows up in San Francisco and in Baltimore. And Detroit, by the way, also Houston. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the point is, these little anomalies that crop up, I dig it, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I and I can respect that. I understand it. It's just purple's not a color that I like. Like that's like that's why right. I like the Marlins colors. Yeah. It's because they're different. Yeah, those Miami. Right. Yeah, the way that they yeah, use the that teal. Miami and, teal or blue, yeah. you know, like cobalt blue, and that. That like salmon or salmon red with is the black killer. looks really good. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yep, 
But hey, Brig, let's let's wrap this up. And when we get back after this break, we're gonna go through our Braves Mount Rushmore. I'm Jason, and I'm David, and we're the hosts of the Non North Sports Podcast. We're the home of sports talk for everyone. Join us bi-weekly as we talk about the happenings in sports. You can find the non Sports Podcast on Anchor.fm, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever else you find your podcasts. Welcome back, baseball family. Today we're going to go through our our Mount, another one of our Mount Rushmores. We're going to talk about the Atlanta Braves today. Now this is like... I've always known the Braves had a long history, right? I yes. knew a little bit about the Boston Braves. Sure. Just the fact that the name existed. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew about the Milwaukee Braves. Mostly just the fact that they existed. Hank Aaron played in Milwaukee for a little while, That's right? right. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously the Atlanta Braves. Most people in the United States grew up with TBS. So we a lot of us grew up watching the Braves in the 90s. Especially that team that was so, so good. That only, unfortunately, won one World Series title. Correct. So, uh, so very familiar with the Braves. I think I said before, like I could, I could have given you that that lineup top to bottom, one through nine, four out of the five pitching staff. I could do it. Um, let's see here: John Smoltz, Tom Glavin, Greg Maddox, Steve Avery. I can't know. I don't know the fifth off the top either. of my head. No, but I'm so impressed that I know four. To be honest, with you. Skiffy McGee, probably. That's who it was. <laughs> it was in that documentary. Oh yes, very yeah. good. That's right. Okay, very good. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Braves before we get started here, Brig. So this is an old, old, old franchise. Like I said, I did yeah. not realize this. Been around for in their 146th season. So in four years, they're going to hit their 150. What's that, sesqu- sesquicentennial? Fair? I think that is sesquicentennial. Okay. That's a long time. Um, it's a big word. Well, thank you. Might <laughs> be the biggest I know. Let's be honest. <laughs> so... Overall record, 501 winning percentage, 10,735 wins, 10,688 losses, 20,000 games is a whole lot. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've been around for almost 150 years. 10 or 20,000 games is very, very. Well, this is that's on over 30,000. It's over 21,000. Yeah, the math. Yeah, we we love math. We love math on this show. We're so good at it, especially on the fly. (laughs) Loving it. Anyway, (laughs) yeah, you're right. (laughs) Twenty thousand. So, so we've got we've got 26 playoff appearances, 17 pennants, three (laughs) World Series titles. Okay, that feels a little bit to me like underachieving. But given the Yankees and their 26 and their vast history as well, 27. I apologize. That was based off of another conversation we had yesterday. But so I appreciate that. (laughs) <laughs> but winningest manager is Bobby Cox with a 557 winning percentage, 21, sorry, 2,149 wins, 1,709 losses. Yep. And it's funny because you look at managers, like you think some of the best ones are going to, oh, he's got to have a 600 winning percentage. 557 is really high. Yeah. That is really high and very good. Yeah. And for him to only have one World Series title in the time with Atlanta yeah. is a big deal. Oh, of course it is. Underachieving. Yeah. But at the same time, it's great. It's great that he got one. Yeah, because some a teams, lot of guys don't. Some teams still don't even have one. The entire some, franchise. Some one team still does not have a World Series appearance. Yep. So, yeah. all right. <laughs> Let's now get... they have eleven retired numbers. They do. Well. Yes. One of those being um, Jackie Robinson. That's right. So and we count that. Every, yeah. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. You have to. Yeah. Because there are some teams that have none. Yeah. Except Jackie, except Jackie Robinson. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So. Ten players with retired jerseys. Let's get into our Mount Rushmore in no particular order. Right. Brig, give me yeah. your first Mount Rushmore. So my first one is, this is my no-brainer pick. I'm going to go with a guy who played in Atlanta for 20 years, Brad. Long time. 20 years with one club. I mean, he played at two other clubs, three, I think, for, uh, I don't know, half seasons, and mm-hmm. mid- midway through trades and stuff. 20 years at one club is astronomical feat, I think. Mm-hmm. And a Hall of Famer, eight-time okay. All-Star, Cy Young winner, so we're talking pitching, part of the 95 club. There you go. Oh, man. He even won a Silver Slugger Award, Brad. Well, you know, some pitchers have to win it. Somebody has Somebody to win it. Somebody has that's, to. That's the way I see that. But <laughs> it's still... The fact, that, the fact that you're like... It's like being... <laughs> Um, I won't use that one. Do it. <laughs> the tallest little person in the room, I feel no, like. You no, know? No. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly <laughs> right. A bunch, a bunch of 
075 hitters, this guy hit 100. That's right. That's what it feels like. Well, and this guy's at 159 <laughs> batting average career. There you go. 159. So it's I even better than case. you thought. Yeah. <laughs> no further questions, Your Honor. There we go. <laughs> uh, uh, in NLCS MVP, he got the Roll Age Relief Award. 69.0 war with 213 wins, 155 losses. A career ERA of 3.33. John Smoltz. John Smoltz. That's one of mine as well. Yes, so, we overlapped. On the first one. Look at yes! that. Yes. All right. And yeah, I like man. that we're in person. We can actually have five. It's so much better. It, it is so much better. Yeah, it, yeah, it rolls. You, just, you should just move here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, like you brought up 20 years with one team. Especially, uh, baseball has become a very nomadic sport. Oh, great. This is something that I've started saying. I like the word nomad. You, I you're good at it. it. I think you. I it's appreciate nice. that. Yeah. But, um, but pitchers especially move around a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. Like relievers, I've said they're like one-year contracts every single year. That's very common. Pitchers, I feel like, are four or five-year contracts, and they're going to move on to the next team. You That's know, right. It's very rare for somebody. You mean starter, starting pitchers? Starting pitchers, yeah. 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 Yeah, relievers are different. You just... Anyways. <laughs> I, so, knew, I knew what you meant. We're with you. But, yeah, so everybody's moving around a lot. And, you know, back in this back in this day, yeah, yeah. back in this era, it was more common for guys to stay put, yeah. but not 20 years. No. Uh, we, we've done a whole lot of research on these Mount Rushmores over the last little while, and it's been hard to find guys who are in a place for more than eight years tops. Yeah. Like, the fact that he wanted to be in Atlanta, Atlanta wanted him there, is a big deal. You know, my favorite, my favorite detail about John Smoltz is that he's in the Hall of Fame, and he's the only pitcher to be there after having Tommy John surgery. It is. Yeah. That's my favorite. Because, you know, this, Tommy John surgery, I think, was invented like the 70s. You know, it was on Tommy John. But it was, Mid-70s? Yeah, yeah, but I think it was, I still feel like it was like, A, not very common, that mostly you saw guys with rotator cuff issues. Oh, yeah. You know, that I remember when I was coming up, it's like, oh, dude, it's rotator cuff. Like, oh, man. Well, that's the surgery it. I had. Two. Yeah, I've had two rotator cuff oh, surgeries. Geez. Can't yeah. imagine. Sucks. I probably should. It's so bad. But <laughs> <laughs> but now Tommy John has become a rite of passage, so we're gonna likely see more people. Well, Otani's had it twice. Twice. Yeah. Brian Wilson had it twice. Right. I think the third time was the end of his career. Yeah. Or maybe he didn't have it. I don't know. But everybody has Tommy John surgery. It's true. You know. Yeah. And and back, earlier and earlier and earlier. Right? Yeah. Sooner in their career. Some kids, I feel like, are getting it preemptively in high school. What? That's, I heard that. And you like, seriously? Like, yeah. The kids are like, I'm going to need it anyway. I might as well get it now. But the thing is, is, like, why do that then if you could potentially have it twice? And I, I think the thinking mm. behind that is at one point is like you get it once, you'll never need it again. But we've seen that that is definitely not the case. Okay, so I was in high school when I had my rotator cuffs done. Yeah. Both of them. Oof. And I'm telling you, I could do it again. Yeah. Like, yeah. I could see myself needing it in, you know, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the shoulder thing. The shoulders are so complex. There's a lot going on there. But the elbow, like they've got the Tommy John down good. You know, we, Otani's hitting a hundred plus on the gun after two of them. Yeah, which you is know? nuts. And I, I'm a little afraid that he's going to need a third. But at that point, <laughs> maybe he'll move him the outfield. You move him the outfield. You know, but I don't know. I don't know. But no, it's a big deal having John Smoltz in the. It's the first guy in the Hall of Fame with Tommy John because at one point it felt like a death sentence to your career. Yeah, well, first and only still, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, and, and that's good. That's that's going to hold for at least another handful of years. Yes, so absolutely, very good. Brad, what do you? Since we overlapped, why don't you go next? Okay, my next one, I'm going to go with Greg Maddox. Oh, uh, so Greg Maddox is actually uh, my second favorite pitcher growing up. I really liked watching him. My first, obviously, was Randy Johnson because I was a Mariners fan. Yeah, going to be biased. And well, and you like machines. I do. <laughs> just, I just made that up. Yeah. <laughs> he is bionic. But no, no, for real though, like Greg Maddox was the guy who, it's like if you wanted to learn how to pitch, you watch Greg Maddox. Yeah. Because not everybody can throw 100. Not yeah. everybody can whip it like Randy Johnson did. But you can learn the principles and the meaning behind control. Yeah. Because he had pinpoint surgical accuracy, lived on the black. My dad said growing up, if Edgar Martinez doesn't swing at a pitch, it's not a strike. Yeah. And I feel that's the same way about Greg Maddox. Is if it's anywhere near the plate, it's a strike. You, you know, know, like he's obviously gonna throw it to get guys to like swing out of the zone because yeah. they're assuming it's gonna be a strike. Yeah. But if if it's close to the plate, it's a strike because that's how accurate he was. Yeah. No, it's absolutely true. So you just reminded me that uh, of my one of my favorite memes is a Greg Maddox meme. Um, this one right here, and we'll put this. We got to put this up. 
Uh, he asked Greg Maddox to paint his house, but all he did was paint the corners. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. And it's got That's blue perfect. paint all over the... We'll put... For those of you listening, we can't show you, but if you're watching on YouTube, you'll get to see it. We'll put it... Let's put it on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll put it on go. social media. So follow us. <laughs> if you don't follow us, go follow Baseball Together. Uh, Instagram, follow at Baseball, the number two together on Twitter, and, and you'll see it there when this yeah, episode that's right. comes out. Perfect. But no, that's great. So this is this is another thing I like about Greg Maddox. Okay, so there is a term, an idiom, a baseball idiom that is called a Maddox. Yes, you know about the Maddox. I do. Yeah. So a Maddox. I'm reading this directly from Baseball.com's gloss or ML Baseball.com. Ah! Let's go check out Baseball.com for more information. <laughs> MLB.com. That's so stupid. <laughs> the glossary on MLB.com. Uh, a Maddox describes a start in which a pitcher tosses a complete game shutout on fewer than 100 pitches. Yep. Um, since 1988, the first year ac- first year accurate pitch count data is available. Maddox ranks first in the majors with 13 such starts. Wow! Nobody 13 else. 13 complete game shutouts under with 100 pitches. Under 100 pitches. Oh my word! Nobody else has ever thrown more than seven. Because he would get out there, and and he said himself that his approach was not to get guys to miss, yeah, but to get throw. A good enough pitch that they would swing, but a not bad enough pitch that they couldn't square it up. Yeah. So he he threw a lot of ground ball outs. Totally. Oh yeah. A lot of ground ball outs, and I feel like that's part of the reason he got so many wins. The Braves did so well because Crash Davis says throw more ground balls, strikeouts are fascist. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a real thing. Yeah. Because if you've got a strikeout pitcher up there, he's not going to get the run support that he wants because everybody's falling asleep in the field. Yeah, you know that's that's not a good thing for anybody. No, it's not. You know, it's nice he's mowing everybody down. It's entertaining. It's fun. To, it's fun you know, for if us. You're racking fans. up 15 yeah. Ks, but if you're standing out in the field, you're bored. When it comes time to hit, you're not mentally acute and ready to go. So that has a lot to do, I think, with his success as well. Is that everybody around him was involved in the game. He's getting everybody involved, and they're ready to go. Mentally and physically, when it came time for them to hit, yeah, that's a big thing. That's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, really that's is. good. That's X factor stuff. Big time. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. All right, so Greg Maddox is my number two. Who's your number two? Uh, number two on my list is Warren Span. Actually, okay. Warren Span, another pitcher. So mm-hmm. we've had three pitchers now. Some great pitchers coming out of Atlanta. Apparently, I'm telling you, the Braves because he was Milwaukee, right? Uh, yeah, he yeah, played. Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee. So he started his career in 1942 and then took three years off to go to war. Very common, uh, if not almost universal, right? Mm -hmm. And then what he ended up doing was uh, playing for another 20 years in the same franchise. So um, he spent, uh, again, some time bouncing around a little bit at the end of his career. Uh, Maybe a little, you know, seven games here, four games there, that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But he played all of the rest of his games in the Braves organization. <clears throat> for 20 years his career war get ready for this career war mm-hmm. 100.1 career war that's pretty good yeah <laughs> hall of famer as well cy young award winner three-time era title part of the 1957 world series squad and now for my favorite statistic 17 time all-star that's a big deal set out lot. of 20 years yeah the, <laughs> the consistency and the resiliency alone you, it's is insane standing yes that's that's so that's so good. Yeah, because a lot of guys big. can put together a lot of it all star caliber seasons. Yeah, but maybe it comes the second half of the season. Maybe they're not healthy enough to start the season because of spring coming out of spring training. Yeah, or, you know there, there's a lot of things that have to go with health and consistency that guys don't put together. You know, perennial all stars don't put together consistent year over year all star seasons. And the fact that he's able to do it for 17 of his 20 what 21 20, years, 20 and change. 20, yeah. yeah, yeah, that. Especially coming back after the war, you know, being two years later. Three, yeah, three. Yeah. yeah so. No, I, so. Well, two he, years after the war is when Oh, he's yes. Star. That's but, right. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's that's a big deal. That's awesome. Yeah. So. War in span. A little, little research there for you, but um, pretty exciting. Very cool. Yeah. What about you? You got one more? Uh, let's go ahead and take, take a break. break. Let's take a break because I've already. We've taken oh, yeah, a break. Oh, yeah. You're, you're right. Already. So let's take a break. When we get back, we'll get more into our Atlanta Braves, Milwaukee Braves, and Boston Braves happens. Not Rushmore. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jacks. I don't care if I never 
get back with me, root, root, root for the whole day. Don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Shop kids baseball shirts at 9plusss.com. Welcome back, baseball family. Thanks for taking a quick break with us and sticking around. We are going to jump back into our Atlanta Braves Mount Rushmore. We've got at least two names to come. We don't know where we'll overlap for the next ones. We already had one overlap this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's very common for us. And I'm I'm sure we'll overlap. I mean, we'll save it for the last one, but I'm sure we'll overlap on that one because it's a pretty common consensus. I'm not going to say what it is. Well, assuming that might be my next one, actually. Should we save it? Because we know it's going to happen. Let's, Let's save, save it at the end. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. That. All right. All right. Do you want me to go next? Yeah, you go next. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my next one is actually Dale Murphy. Um, yeah, it's it, not that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for me, for me, Dale Murphy is the best player to never make the Hall of Fame. Okay. That, um, And, you know, someday he might make it in with the Culture Club. Yeah, you know the, whatever that I don't remember what the actual name is, but we call him the Culture Club. Yeah, we do. Um, so Dale Murphy's a two-time All Star, back-to-back All Star at yeah. that. Yeah. Um, 1982, 1983. Sorry, not All Star MVP. Yeah, that's was, a bigger deal. Oh, that's a bigger yeah, deal. Not MV, not All Star. Yeah, yeah MVP. back-to-back MVPs, but seven-time All Star, four-time Silver Slugger, five-time Gold Glove, and I feel like that's a really big deal that he's not in the Hall of Fame. He had a he had a good peak. Uh, from 80 to 87, where he was an all-star, like I said, seven of those eight seasons. Yeah. The issue, though, here, Brig, I think why he didn't get into the Hall of Fame is because he's a lifetime 265 hitter. Yeah. Okay? That's probably why. 398, 398 home runs of the co- over the course of an 18-year career. Mm-hmm. Um, that batting average is low for the era. Yeah. But um, here's the thing, though. Okay. Outfielder, first baseman, those are offense first positions, right? Yeah. Yeah. But Dale Murphy was a catcher. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he's, he spent the uh, first few years of his career. No, I wouldn't say majority, but he spent. He came up as a catcher, came, which, yeah, that's is, right. which is a defense first position. Extremely defensive. Very much so. Yes. You know, the, until recently. Until, and that's only because those guys are anomalies. Something's going on. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like Buster Posey, I feel like, was like the really first big power hitting catcher, which is funny because he's not that big. And he's not that. Yeah. It hasn't, yeah. I, I feel like if you walked down the street and saw Buster Posey and Average Joe, they would look right. the same. But if you see Gary Sanchez, you're like, that's an. That, that, he looks a like dude. a Kraken. Yeah. He's yeah, huge. He's, he's a dude. He's huge. Yeah. You know, but, but no, I. I feel like having come up as a catcher, that offense was not necessarily something that they focused on with him. And 265 for a catcher is good yeah. back then. Yeah. Right? Decent. So maybe send him into the Hall of Fame as a catcher. I don't know. I don't. Anyway. No. They, two time. Can't do that. It, yeah, that's true. He didn't spend enough time no. behind the plate. But yeah. two time MVP, though, I feel like that alone is enough. Is it? Not as like obviously unanimous. Like, But he, he could have gotten 76% of the votes. Should have gotten 76% of the votes. Right? I'm inclined to agree with you, but again, I grew up when he was playing, and yeah, you know, we got to see him all the time, and he was a big deal in Utah for some reason. I don't actually know why. Yeah, I don't know. But is he from there? Where is he from? Uh, he's from Portland. I think that might be part of the reason I like him. Oh he's yeah, not from the, the that's Portland. right. Yeah, he went to BYU. Oh, that's, that's what it is. It. He went yeah. to BYU. Yeah, I knew there was a tie there somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, especially you grew up in the Orem area, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my especially grandfather when... taught at BYU for thirty plus years. Wow, I yes, did not sir, know that. That's true fact. Inter- true fact. That's a true fact. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, I feel like Dale Murphy belongs in the Hall of Fame, and if mm-hmm. nothing else, on the Braves Mount Rushmore, which I feel like to me the hardest part about this. Some teams it's hard to find four. Sometimes so, this one it was hard to find just four. Yes. You know. Yes. It's, there I have had the same lot, problem, especially the '95 team. Well, it was and I'm a huge Chipper Jones fan. Are you huge Chipper Jones fan? You know yes. he's my he's my next guy. What? Yeah, no way! No! <laughs> he's my next guy. I had him on my list. How did he not make your list? Uh, Greg Maddox made it oh, instead. Oh yeah. So. See, we did the flip. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. <laughs> if there is an honorable mention, it'd be Chipper Jones. Well, and I would say Greg Maddox. 
Perfect. Yes. There we go. <laughs> so we almost completely <laughs> overlapped. Let's get into Chipper Jones. Let's okay? do it. Chipper, Chipper Jones. Jones is the man. Right, he was the dude. We yes. all loved him. And remember when they moved him from third base to left field? We all threw a fit. I did. Yeah, everybody did. Yep. And there's this tale that we all know if you grew up watching the Braves in the '90s about Chipper Jones not being able to have the fingers of his batting gloves sticking out of his back pockets of his baseball pants. Right? Oh, okay. I've there's there's that. this legendary wives' tale going around, and it's been going around since I was a kid. I don't know where it got started. It's probably completely unfounded. But here's how the story goes. Okay. And it. It stuck, stuck with me. So everybody loved the fingers out of the back pockets. For whatever reason, it was like it was like Griffey's backward hat. Like it was the thing that you yeah. knew about. Chipper well, Jones. when you do it, well, and for everybody, like it, you love the the glove sticking out of the back pocket. And the way you do it is, if you have the right internal pockets, you can do it. If you have the external pocket, like most little league, yeah, it, it doesn't work exactly. You have to stick them all the way down. Yeah. But if you have the internal pocket, you'd stick just so that the the Velcro right. is barely inside. Then you've got like almost the entire glove. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So cool. It is cool. And it yeah. started with Chipper Jones. That's one okay. of the things that happened. So anyway, there's this I, there's this story going around since I was 10 or whatever okay. that he got fined. Like the, the, there was a rule. There was a, he got a warning and they said, okay, you can't do that anymore. Kind of like with Ben Zobrist in the black cleats. Okay. Yeah. They were like, knock it off. And he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, so it was either the club or it was MLB or somebody came out with Probably a, MLB. Yeah. With some, this is the, again, legend, but somebody, I guess, came out with a fine. They're like here, $500 fine or whatever. Every time you play a game with your fingers sticking out of your gloves, sticking out of your back, back pockets. So he just walked in before every game and put cash on the table, or he wrote a check and set yeah. it on the ta- on the guy's desk. <laughs> and he was just like, because they didn't have automatic withdrawal back then, or whatever, <laughs> so he just handed it over. And then, Thank you very much. I'm going to go do my thing now. <laughs> That's, funny. That's funny. I have not actually heard that story. I didn't have you not? That. No. no. It's just it's no. one of those things I heard one time. I've yeah. never been able to let go of it. That's awesome. It I probably like is one of those things I want to believe. Right? Uh, yeah. There's no founding. Oh, we should maybe. call him. Let's we'll, call him. We'll give him a call. He's here. Yeah. We're we're close. It's yeah. true. It's fine. Okay. Is that a long distance call? No. <laughs> we might have to do it collect. Uh, Mr. Jones, this is baseball together. Mm-hmm. Do you accept charges? You're receiving a call no. from baseball together. Uh, a Hall of Famer, obviously. I yes. think that you know that made a ton of sense to everybody. He was an all-star eight times, won the batting title, part of the 95 World Series team, two-time Silver Slugger Award, and an MVP. And uh, we all wore number 10. Because it was Chipper Jones. We all did. 85.3 career war. He's got almost 9,000 at-bats. Mm-hmm. 468 home runs, which for a third baseman is crazy. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a big deal. Hey, on top of that, switch hitting third baseman. Exactly. And yeah. I think maybe part of the reason I love Chipper Jones is the first time my whole life, like... I was at just the perfect age to learn why that was important mm-hmm. and since since the significance of it when my dad was like, No, 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 like like check this out. It's a big this deal. Is, this is huge, yeah. right? And it still is huge. Mm-hmm. So uh, batting average lifetime three oh three. It's pretty good. Yeah, he spent his entire career in Atlanta. Again, nineteen years. We have a theme. <laughs> the theme, for those of you who haven't caught on, is Atlanta is loyal to its players. And the players are loyal to Atlanta. Yeah, it right? goes both ways. It does go, and the fans feel the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. And that's one of the things actually I have I did notice that over the years that the guys I liked at the Braves when I was younger were still there as I was getting older. Yes, and it, I appreciated it. Yeah, that it wasn't like constant turnover. Like I have to follow him everywhere, you know. Because like as a Mariners fan, there was a long stretch where like um, where we would go to a game. And I'd be looking for something I want to get, you know, get like a jersey or a jersey or something. And I wouldn't buy anything. Right. Because I was like, well, that guy's probably not going to be here next week. You yeah. know, that certainly I, not even next year, but next yeah, week. Yeah. Yeah. Like that jersey is going to be out of date. And why would I pay a full pot for it now? Where if I do want it later, yeah. I can get it half off yeah. in six months. Exactly. You know, but with the Atlanta Braves, you know those guys and they were there forever. Yeah. So, no, oh, that's really awesome. Cool. Really cool. You know, go to the team store down there at Truist, they call it now. Yeah. Today, yeah, and Dale Murphy stuff is one of the team, one of the names that you'll see everywhere. Oh, really? Yeah. So on the lo- on the wall of team jerseys uh-huh. or player jerseys, there's Smoltz and Maddox and Jones yeah. and whatever. But Dale Murphy's one of them. Yeah, is it's the blue one. Uh huh. And it's the baby blue one. That's so. That's, that's right that's with so the V neck. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. No, it is awesome. Very cool. Should we just do it? Let's do it. Ready? One, <clears throat> two, 
three. Hank Aaron. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> two high fives. This is two. <laughs> All right. Hank Aaron, obviously a Hall of Famer. Transcendent Man. talent. One MVP, which is strange to me. Seriously. However, 25-time All-Star. I was impressed, wildly impressed with Warren Spann's 17. But 25, the fact that the dude... So, Hank Aaron pay, played for, what? It says 20... I have 23 years I have 23 here. years so as 25 well. 25-time All-Star. That's strange. I, I don't should, know what that's about. But I, I only see... Uh, his inaugural and season and his and his last season yeah. are the only ones that he did not make the all-star team. And maybe that's the yeah, I don't know. Maybe they just flipped the math. Yeah. Could have. Either way. Twenty one years. Twenty one. <laughs> Twenty one years in Atlanta. Well, and those other two years were in Milwaukee. So I guess the last were, two seasons. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And yeah. that's not with the Milwaukee Braves. Okay, that no, makes Milwaukee sense. Milwaukee Brewers. Yeah. yeah he Brewers. finished with the Brewers. But Which, that, still that's going home though. It was going home because he started, started with, with the, the Milwaukee Braves. Exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Yep. I and that would have been 1954. I should have done more research on this before <laughs> we started. Because I was like, oh, Hank Aaron, that'll be easy. <laughs> so much nuance and strangeness to this. No, nuance but, is exactly right. But two-time batting title. And um, in many people's minds, the true home run champion um, with 755 career home runs. Yes. Past the babe. Yeah. Was a huge deal at the time, and this is the thing: is that Hank Aaron is not only a home run hero; he was a baseball hero and a civil rights a hero. Civil rights hero. It's transcendent so much. Like it goes beyond because for him to go through what he went through while chasing the babe, yeah, um, you know, like racially, socially, everything, yeah, like he's a hero. He is a hero. He is a legitimate sports and otherwise hero. Yes, and I think it's outstanding. I don't know if Hank Aaron gets enough credit. He doesn't, and that's the problem. So, And we've talked about this before, but one of my favorite moments in all of baseball history is when he beat the Babe mm-hmm. and got 715 mm-hmm. in Atlanta. It was April 8th, 1974. So we're in the deep, deep south, and a black man is getting a standing ovation from this enormous crowd, thousands and thousands of people. And, it, and we're just not that far removed from all the strife and all the violence yeah. and everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. So I think that is, it is, really is one of my favorite moments in all of baseball history. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and something that I think was a big deal to show solidarity, inclusion, and appreciation was the two guys who came out of the crowd. Like, it's stupid. Don't, like, I don't, sure. I don't condone coming out of the crowd ever for anything at all. But these two white guys who came out of the crowd to congratulate him. Yeah. I, th- I remember watching a documentary and a lot of people were saying like, this is going to go bad. This is not going to end well. Yeah. You know, and they came and they, they pat him on the back and he said, I think I watched an interview with him from a few years ago mm-hmm. where he said they were great guys. One of them was a doctor. Really? You know, or something like that. If I'm remembering right, that's what it was. Oh, cool. And it was like that he was like, Cool, you know. Yeah. I really well, appreciate he shook their hand game. on the while well, he was around on the bases, yeah. right? He shook their hands, yeah. and, was, and and that that at the time was a huge deal. Yeah, that that happened did not end poorly, and I feel like that's that should that clip is shown all the time, but I don't feel like the context is truly appreciated like yeah. it should be because that, that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. It was huge. So huge. Yeah. Well, okay, so I got to get into some more statistics. Go for it because this <clears throat> it gets even better for me. All right. Mm-hmm. Now, his career war is 143.1. Mm-hmm. That puts him seventh all time. All time? In the history of baseball. Wow. He's number seven all time in war. <laughs> okay. So- Let that sink in for a minute. And mm-hmm. I'm going to hit you with another one. Career at bats, 12,364. Second all time at maybe, bats. Maybe he should have had more home runs. Ooh. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Played appearances, 3,298. That's third all time. Games played, 3,900 or 298. He never won a game without an at bat. That puts him third all time for games played. Wow. Yeah. That's so. Here's some, kind of the other side of the coin is I've heard the argument that Hank Aaron was a compiler. Okay. That he played for so long, and that's yeah. why he was able to set the home run record. Sure, um, but here's the thing. So you do it then, right? Like, so, so somebody else. Do well, it. Not only that. <laughs> okay, so so 40 home runs is a lot in a season. Absolutely, especially back in the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah, right. So, but he had one, two, three, four, five, eight. six, seven, eight. Seasons. Eight seasons with 40 or 40 more. 40 or more home runs. Yeah. 
that is unheard of. It's insane. Nobody does that. No, it's insane. Like bonds, but he had a he had help. Yeah. You know, I remember when I was like I had to have been like nine or ten. Yeah. You know, eight, nine or ten, something. I remember seeing that Ken Griffey hit forty five home runs in one season and mm-hmm. I was blown out of my mind. It's like, oh yeah. Forty five home runs, that's so many. Yeah. That was an average year for Hank Aaron. Yeah. Like that's that's such a big deal. That's so cool. Right. You and know? over half of his career. Mm-hmm. So if you break it down, the the amount of seasons I think he went 30 home runs was like 17 and he had 20 or more in 20 or 20 like 20 of his seasons or something. It's easier like that. to count backwards. He had 3 seasons where he didn't hit 20 home runs. <laughs> okay. That's why I thought. <laughs> there you go. I thought. <laughs> yeah. Insanity. Yeah. Dude yeah. was dominant mm-hmm. and he continues to be at the top of all these lists. So Yes. He does. And this is the, I feel like Somebody to hit that many home runs and still hit 305. Yeah, you're more than just a power hitter. You're a, you're a, a, amazing. Like, amazing. I say the word transcendent, but transcendent talent. Right, and like, he was he bounced between right field and first base, so he was also capable as a defender and won three Gold Gloves. Yeah. So it's not yeah. all about his plate appearances. Like right. the dude was a f- overall contributor mm-hmm. yeah. on every every angle. Yeah. Well, and those and those are offense first positions. Yeah. Which. Obviously, you've got one of the greatest hitters of all time. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just saying he's yeah. capable, right? He's a this is a ball player. Yeah, and you know what? He maybe have been. He may have could have extended his career if the DH was around and he moved to the AL. You know, I mean, he was 42 when he's he when was he retired. 42. When he retired. You know, if if he had had a DH option in the American League, he might have extended his career another two years. Maybe so. Maybe I yeah. don't know for sure because he only played 85 games in that last year. But yeah, yeah that's. Mm-hmm. Next level, man. Next level. Next level yep. stuff. And he passed away in... Recently. Yeah. 2021, January 22nd. That's yeah. what it was. It was this year. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember that... I think that interview was a replay on Dan Patrick about that time. Oh, I see. He passed away because he had him on and he was talking to him about yeah. it. But, That's great. But yeah, but baseball family, let us know what you think about our Braves Mount Rushmore. Is there anybody we... I mean, there's obviously people we left Tons out. of people. Yeah, there, tons. And you know what? There's a good argument for, for just about anybody, you know. Well, not you, anybody. Well, Tom they have Glavin, a little, Tom Glavin. I feel like has a legitimate argument. Yeah. Well, they have eleven retired numbers. I mean, we yeah. could have picked from a number of different people. Yes. Yeah. But let us know what you think. Submit to the mailbag at baseballtogether.com. You can, uh, you can go to the top navigation there, click the button, submit, and it'll take you right to the page, and then just send us an email through there. Or yeah. there's a link in the doobly doo. I know not all podcast apps allow the links to be active. That's true. So if it is active, go ahead and click that. It's nice and easy. But if not, go to baseballtogether.com and I tried to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. I really I tried to. It's pretty straightforward. So but let us know what you think. Don't forget to jump on the shop as well at nineplusus.com. That's N-I-N-E-P-L-U-S-U-S dot com. Nine plus us dot com. For those of you watching on YouTube, I am wearing uh, camouflage. Which is pretty cool. Well, you can't see the top of his head. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. But I got my baseball and chill t-shirt on. Mm, Brad's wearing his hot dog t-shirt. Hot dog, yeah. And our Dia Del Mago Copa I've been obsessed with this hat. I've been here at Briggs for... I mean, I don't know when this is going to... When we're going to air this, but we're... I've been here at Briggs' house for a few days, and I've been wearing this hat, like, the whole time. Yeah. So. He borrowed it. And he, I might never see it again. And that's okay. <laughs> I would, that would feel acceptable. I'll take it home with me. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Baseball family, we will catch you next week.